Welcome to Genuine Humans, exploring the stories behind the great marketing leaders of our time and hearing how their journeys have influenced the brands they've built. Brought to you by The Social Element, here are our hosts, Tamara Littleton, CEO and founder, and Wendy Christie, Chief People Officer. Wendy and I are joined today by someone I'm delighted to be able to call a friend, a Californian native Londoner, super connected and respected leader, generous mentor and supporter of young talent and fellow Peloton obsessive. I give you Julie Dolman, Managing Director of Global Expansion at Experian. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I'm so honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Hi, Julie. It's lovely to have you here. Now, Julie, you once told me that your career goal when you were little was to be a woman who carried a briefcase and went to a big fancy office. So how's that going? <laughs> it's pretty aspirational, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, do you know what? I used to um, I used to go to a big fancy office in central London, uh, which was very, very exciting. And now I go to a big fancy office just outside of my bedroom. So I would say that it's going relatively well, but uh, I've never worked at home until now. And so it's uh, it's all part of a new adventure, definitely. <laughs> Nailing it. <laughs> Nailing it, yes, absolutely. Can you share a little bit about your, your role at Experian? And, and it would be great for our listeners to hear how you got to where you are now. So what are you doing now and how did you get here? Yeah, absolutely. So I've got two incredible jobs at Experian. I run global expansion of our consumer business, which means that I get to figure out where we take our consumer businesses around the world. So historically, we were in the US and UK, but Experian operates in more than 30 countries around the world. And what I get to do is I get to figure out where consumers need our services the most. And And uh, in the last four years, we've now taken our consumer business to Brazil, to India, to Colombia, Peru, beginning in South Africa, and now working with some new colleagues in Germany. So it's been a really exciting road. And we've started little startup businesses all around the world. And uh, that's been Job number one. Job number two is that I also run a global innovation program for Experian. And while Experian is an incredibly innovative company, we've never had a single innovation program that's connected all of our businesses together. And so that's been about 18 months in in the making. And I've got a really small team of incredibly brilliant innovators that have been embedding it within our business. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that more within our conversation. That sounds like so much fun. It is. So how did you get to to here then? Can, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah, sure. So I've actually, I've been at Experian for many, many years. And if I actually say the amount of years, it's going to make me sound old, which I'm clearly not. And, <laughs> uh, and when I started, uh, I was in our North America business. So I was there for about 10 years. And I started there just after Experian acquired the consumer business. So prior to that acquisition, Experian was already sort of a big global behemoth, but it was all B2B and didn't actually have a direct consumer business. So they acquired a little startup. Uh, They acquired it from the company that I was actually working at. And I came over shortly after the acquisition. And so it it was really sort of fun being part of a startup, but inside of a big business. And uh, we were literally the the little aliens. We were a young, scrappy startup that Experian had never experienced, and they had no idea what to do with us. And over the years grew to be a really significant part of the business. So now our, our consumer business is over a quarter of our global revenues, which is super exciting and is really a force to be reckoned with. Which, which we love because where we started was trying to convince people that 
no, no, this is going to be really great. We can actually talk directly to people about their data. And it took a little bit of convincing, but uh, that that's where my journey started at Experian. And so I, um, I've always been a marketeer and I've always been in some sort of marketing and customer acquisition function. And when I left the US, I was running all of our online marketing. And that was a very, very significant piece of the business. It was uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue and hundreds of millions of dollars in marketing spend. And when I was asked to come to the UK, I was asked to run sales and marketing, which I thought, ooh, that's really interesting. Doing that in another country, doing it in a place where the brand is actually in a little bit of a different place than it was in the US. And uh, and I got to have end-to-end marketing. So not just uh, the online piece, but I got to have offline. I got to have PR and outdoor, which is not something we ever did in the US. And so I thought, yeah, what an amazing opportunity. I came over to the UK to do that. And about three months in, I was asked to take over the whole direct-to-consumer business as the managing director. So that was really interesting. And it was fun to have really my first sort of insight into the end-to-end customer journey, which I loved. So everywhere from front-end customer acquisition to the product, to the call center operations and servicing our customers, to working with our technology partners on how to make the engine work and work better. And, um, and that was It was the first time, first of all, I'd ever lived outside of the U.S., which was Mm. a whole other challenge in and of itself, but also a huge opportunity. And it was really, really exciting to see the business from a completely different perspective. That was about three years. I ended up uh, going back to the U.S. And 15 short months later, I was asked to come back to the U.K. and run Global Expansion. So it's been a little bit of a a wild journey. I I highly recommend opportunities that take you outside of the country. I'm not sure I totally recommend moving your family twice back and forth across (laughs) across the globe. It's a lot of packing and unpacking, um, but but definitely worth it. They've rolled with it, have they? They have. (laughs) Yes, definitely. So let's go back a bit further and talk about what led up to this fantastic career. And we'll start with Julie the child, if that's okay. Sure. So what were you like when you were little? God, that's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I I am a first generation American. Both of my parents were immigrants. I would say that we lived a pretty simple life, but a great one. There was lots of playing outside. There was lots of riding bikes in suburban neighborhood in California. We, uh, we, we were sort of the typical go outside, don't come back until it gets dark. Uh, but if the ice cream man comes, you're not allowed to buy ice cream from the ice cream man because they sell ice cream with razor blades in it. My mother was convinced that was a thing. I'm not sure that was ever a thing, but she was convinced it was a thing. Or maybe she just didn't want to fork out for the ice cream. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but I would say we, I, we were happy. I was a happy kid. I used to get called bossy a lot, which I sort of, that never bothered me. And now I realize that just meant confident. So I embrace it. I I think bossy is stroke future leader. (laughs) Yeah, who knew? Who knew? Uh, And I've got a, a little sister who's four years younger and we used to fight incessantly and uh, do all the normal stuff that sisters do. And uh, yeah, I would say it was, it was a good, it was a good upbringing. It was a good childhood. And I have amazing, amazing parents who were super funny and open and accepting and loving and supportive. That's wonderful. And when you were growing up, what did you want to be? Well, I think, you know, my, my huge aspirations were exactly what Tamara explained at the beginning. I sort of, I really, really aspired to be the lady that sort of walked through a big city because growing up in suburbia, I, I really, I wanted to live in like New York or somewhere really like fancy. And I wanted to carry a briefcase like all the businessmen I used to see did um, and, you know, kind of walk with my head held high and rule the world. Um, and, and that seemed hugely aspirational until you have to 
decide a major uh, in university and decide what that really translates into, which I had no idea. And then uh, once I graduated, it was like, great. So what do I do to carry the briefcase around and walk <laughs> through a big city? And, and that was even scarier. Funny enough, I, I actually, I, I majored in advertising and communications, which is hilarious to think about now because um, I went to uni a few years ago <clears throat> and all of, the, uh, all of the channels and the incredible ecosystem that exists within marketing and advertising now, we didn't even have classes about then. So, uh, so I, I suppose you could say I sort of learned on the job. And what's the worst job you've ever had? Oh God, I, well, I've had two of them. So, so I think they're kind of tied. The first one was when I was in high school, I worked for a telemarketing company. So I sat at these like sort of big long tables with a whole bunch of other people and I sold at like vacation rentals, which was the most excruciatingly boring job on the planet. And um, one day one of the leads was uh, a guy uh, who's clearly his name was Jesus. And, um, I called him and, you know, asked if Jesus was available and everyone like started, you know, laughing and roaring around me. And I thought, you know what, this is exactly why I need to go to university. I can't do this job. Um, and, and so that one wasn't great at all. And it was one of those, like, look at your watch and it's only been four minutes since you looked the last time. So I decided that wasn't for me. And then the second worst job, and I'll preempt this with, sorry for anybody who works there now, but I, uh, I lost a bet in uni and I had to go get a job at McDonald's and <laughs> I, I've never been a person that has walked out on a job ever. And in fact, I have an incredible tenure as I, as I started to, to talk about at the beginning of our chat and I lasted for four hours at McDonald's. I don't know if it was like the grease of the fryer or the, the mother who was like shouting at me about the toy that showed up in the Happy Meal. But I was like, uh. I can't. I can't do this. The uniform's too scratchy and my face is too oily and the humiliation was too much. So that was four hours and, uh, and, and the second worst job I've ever had. That, that is so funny, actually, because I, I actually did a summer at McDonald's and I had a very, very different experience. And um, it was one of those things that I think I'm so nerdy that I desperately wanted to get the stars on your badge. Uh, I was I was only like 17 or something like that. And I was just obsessed about I want to get all five stars and, <laughs> and I'm going to do everything I can. And yeah, I, I just yeah, it's funny how it's a completely different experience. <laughs> completely. I, I, ha I had to get this job. My my whole four years of uni, I was a bartender. And um, when I needed to, I, I quickly realized when I got to uni that I, I had no money and I really wanted to do lots of fun stuff. So I needed to find a job that would make me the most money in the shortest amount of time legally clearly um and so I got a job as a bartender and so this was the, the, the McDonald's piece was my second job and I was kind of like hmm I currently work at a job where the customer's never right and now I'm gonna spend time at McDonald's where the customer is always right and I have to placate to the happy meal prize that is the wrong one I was like yeah it's not right for me gotta go back and has there been anyone in particular who's really influenced your career? Do you know, I would say that probably my parents and, and not because my parents had massive corporate jobs, but because they were always my foundation and always my rock and always pushing me to put, put myself out there and do things that scared me and helped fill me with the confidence that I could do it. And that they were certainly there to help support me emotionally, but that I could do anything that I wanted to do. And, you know, it was funny, I, I, as I was growing up, you know, they, they sort of, they, they both had really good jobs. And now looking back, I realized that, you know, while my, my mother in particular didn't have a big corporate job, you know, she's the executive director of a nonprofit organization for 25 plus years in the AIDS and HIV community in the eighties. And she was fighting for gay rights before people really knew what fighting for gay rights was. And now that I look back, I mean, she was the epitome of 
putting yourself out there and leaning into something that you don't know anything about, but you know that you can help make a change. And so I'm, I'm completely in awe of her and completely in awe of, you know, what she's accomplished in, in her career. And, you know, she started off at, at the agency as a secretary that was just kind of going back to work when her kids got a bit older. And so I would say that, you know, they, they were both in such different ways, just huge role models to me and absolutely are part of the reason why I am where I am today, for sure. Oh, you must be super proud of them. I am. Definitely. And what are you proudest of in your career? I, do you know, I think just the fact that I have put myself out there. I, you know, I, I don't think I would have ever dreamed of living in another country. I don't think I would have ever dreamed of, you know, put, walking into my boss's office, which, which if you ask either of them, I sort of do this quite a bit <laughs> and just putting forward what I want and, and making sure my, my, my boss calls it declaring. He says, you know, you always declare and I do, and, um, it is scary and it does take me out of my comfort zone every time, but I'm most proud of the fact that I throw my hat into the ring and it's taken me, um, to places I would have never dreamed of in my life. You know, I, I told you at the beginning, I mean, I grew up very simple. I never thought that I would be sitting in any of the offices that I've sat in around the world having these really incredible discussions about helping people and powering opportunities and financial inclusion for people in India or Brazil or South Africa or Uganda. And, you know, I'm just really proud of the fact that I've done things that I found really, really scary. And every time I do it, I sort of walk out and go, oh, I'm proud of myself for that. And it doesn't always work out and it isn't always perfect, but at least I can say I tried. And I sort yeah. of always go into these things knowing that, listen, I can always go back home. And, uh, and I never have, but I, I know that I can. And carry on talking about Experian and, and the brand. What's the biggest change that you've seen in your time at Experian? I think the biggest change has been the focus on the consumer. So as I mentioned, you know, when I when I started, the, the consumer was really new to Experian. Experian's always been really, really great at B2B. But what B2B clients require is significantly different from what the consumer expects. And so in those early days, it was kind of our little consumer business against against the beast. And we sort of had to prove the value. Not only did we end up proving the value from a, from a revenue standpoint, which is really the, the ancillary benefit, we, we proved the value from the fact that we're showing how you can impact consumers for the better and how we can power those opportunities around the world. And it, it is part of our corporate responsibility. And uh, it, it's it's been interesting because I think if you ask people in various parts of our organization now, going on, you know, 19 years later, they will they appreciate the fact that at the end of everything that we're trying to do as a business, whether it be with our B2B clients or directly with consumers, is a consumer trying to do something incredibly personal. That is a really, really powerful place. And I think that that has dramatically evolved over the years. And now Experian, you know, part of our core values and our core strategic focus area is really powering clients and consumers to, to achieve their goals. So the, the narrative has changed, the culture has evolved. And I think that, you know, we, we started out as the little tiny business that was literally the aliens in the corner. And now we sit at the big kid table. And, and I'm really, really proud of that. And, and it kind of it ties in very nicely that, you know, we, we've had this conversation before about genuine human connections. And as you know, that's a big part of what the social element is all about. So how have you actually been able to create those connections between the brand and the customers? Yeah, I think, you know, Experian for for many years has been the one, and it's not just Experian, I would say it's all the bureaus are kind of accused of being the black box and accused of being this sort of dark lord that holds all of the data and is the reason why consumers are declined for credit or the reason why you can't achieve your goals, or the reason why you have sort of your name on a blacklist. 
I think that the way that we've started to build these connections and started to evolve the brand is through transparency, is through a genuine desire and effort to really um, crack open the black box and to really put ourselves out there to help consumers. And I would say there's there's kind of two key examples that I'm incredibly proud of. One is in the US. Um, we have this really great product that has just launched in the UK and um, has been in the US for about a year now, and it's called Boost. And what it does is it actually helps the consumer to boost their score contribute data, show these creditors, you know, what, what you're made of, boost your credit score, get more opportunity through that boosted score. And we're actually the, the conduit to helping make that happen. Really, really powerful and definitely changes the control from just the bureau and the lender to the consumer as well. In Brazil, we've done something really, really different, which was pre-pandemic, of course, um, we, we used to hold these credit fairs and they were in person and we would bring in lenders and bring in consumers and the consumers would be able to go from table to table and negotiate their debts with the lenders. And we were bringing that together. That was an incredibly powerful intro into the lenders viewing consumers as real people and the consumers being able to take control of their debt. Um, that's now digital, which is really, really great and a huge piece of our business. And the other thing that we did in Brazil was we, we drove a truck through 48 cities around the country to actually bring the data to people in some of these rural communities who were in our database, were in the negative database, but maybe either A, didn't know it, B, didn't have access to it, and C, didn't know what to do about it. And so we roll the truck into a town and people come and they queue and they come onto the truck where we show them their data. We have experienced employees on the truck to help walk them through it. And it's actually bringing the data to real people. And so not only is it part of humanizing our brand, but it's also showing, listen, we are here to help. We're not the bad guy. Um, this is your data, but we are certainly here um, as a force for good. And we are here to help connect the consumer to the brands. That's so powerful and, and you know, life changing for individuals yeah. as well. Yeah, I really like that. Absolutely. What's your biggest priority for the year ahead? So as I mentioned, I run a global innovation program and it is the dominant goal. So our absolute focus and what will determine success of this program is truly driving customer centric innovation throughout our business. So the difference between customer-centric innovation and just innovation is that we're really, really good at innovation. We're really good at sitting within the walls of our business and taking incredible capabilities and data points and creating something fantastic. What this is about is before we create within the walls of our business is to go out and really understand what's the job to be done of our customer. And whether that customer is a B2B client or a consumer, really understanding what keeps that person up at night, what's going to help them be successful, what their job to be done truly is, and then going back into the walls of our facilities and building something that actually meets those needs. That is a fundamental culture change and completely different from what we've historically done. And driving that true customer-centric innovation throughout our business is culture change. And culture change requires behavior change. And this behavior change requires us to be fiercely passionate about stepping outside of the walls of our office and validating assumptions directly with clients and directly with consumers. People are really, really passionate about that within Experian. So it isn't, it isn't a hard sell, but it's about consistency. It's about leading through that. And it's about providing the tools to actually enable that in different ways. So that's my focus for the next year. It's no small feat, but I believe that we've, we're, we're well underway. And I think that we're starting to show the impact uh, of this program and, and the impact that it's had over the last 18 months. So 
I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about the benefits, but it's about continuing to embed that within our business and it's within you know, our, our global business. So, you know, this isn't just about, um, you know, doing this in North America. It's about doing it in little parts of Asia Pacific and a- across the, the wide array of countries and relationships, um, you know, within EMEA. Um, so it's, it's really exciting, but it's, it's no small feat. How would you define your leadership style? My leadership style is highly collaborative. I, especially in the role that I currently have, I lead through influence. I, I've i learned to do that in different cultures around the world, which has been fascinating. I have really, really high expectations of myself and my teams. So in order to achieve those expectations, I set really clear really clear objectives and communicate and collaborate all the way through regularly. And I'm really, really committed to making sure that there's, there's never any surprises. No one will ever walk into a performance review with me and be surprised. Mm -hmm. I'm really transparent and really committed to working together to, to make the magic happen. I am passionate about servant leadership And I absolutely love, I I think one of the things that I love most about being a leader is watching people around me thrive and watching people around me go on to do incredible things. And if I know I played some teeny tiny part in that, I, I think it's amazing. Every single person that works for me, I know what they want on their business card the day they retire. Uh, everybody has a development plan that works for me, including me. And not only are business objectives critically important, but personal development goals and objectives are are part of everybody's year-end performance review. So setting quarterly objectives, not just from a business standpoint, but from a personal development standpoint is critical and making sure that we are always working to push ourselves and each other and hold each other accountable to those objectives is something that I'm really, really passionate about. And is that a style that uh, has just sort of evolved or have you been influenced by other leaders along the way or particular business books? So I am lucky enough to be surrounded by some really, really brilliant people, both within our business and outside within my network. I I made a conscious decision about five years ago to really commit to my personal network. In doing so, I have met some absolutely brilliant people doing incredibly creative and brilliant things. Um, Tamara, you, of course, being being one of them who hugely oh. inspire me. Uh, you know, people often ask me, like, what do you do when you're stuck? Or what do you do when you don't know what to do? And my answer to that is I will always phone a friend um, and I will always ring up someone within my network and either just have a chat or go for a coffee or sit in on a podcast or a webcast or a conference. And I get my inspiration from incredible people. And it becomes this immediate shot of energy and immediate injection of kind of creativity and drive. And so I guess I I get energy from brilliant people. And then as far as books go, uh, I'm currently obsessed with two books. One is called The Culture Map. It's a book for, I don't even care if you have a global job or if you don't. The fact of the matter is, is that we are all working personally and professionally with people that come from different backgrounds. And it's a fascinating book, which is all about how to communicate with people who come from different styles and different cultures. And communication is everywhere from Americans who say it like it is, repeat themselves and then follow up with exactly what they said to, you know, some of the Eastern or the Asian cultures that expect you to kind of read the air and reading the air and reading the unsaid is really hard (laughs) when you come from the other end of the spectrum, but it's actually even harder now that we're trying to do that 
through the, the screen and through Zoom as opposed to face to face where you can at least try to muddle your way through it. So mm-hmm. it's a fascinating book and it's all about um, it's being told through sort of real life stories that I think we can all relate to. And then the second one that I would love for every single person to read um, is called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. All I'm going to say is it will take you about 20 minutes to read the book, and it will be something that you will never forget in your life. And some really amazing and incredibly eye-opening reminders told through beautiful art. So um, who, who, whoever you are, whatever you're passionate about, this is a must read for sure. Some great recommendations there. And you you focused on the fact that we are all at home as well at the moment. And um, I know that you're uh, running things from home at the moment. How are you managing to focus on culture and team collaboration? Yeah, it's, um, it's hard. And listen, I think that obviously here in the UK, we're on our third lockdown. For some reason, I think this one's the hardest. I think yeah. that the novelty's worn off. I know for me, you know, I'm I'm pretty good at self motivating and and finding ways to self motivate. Um, and even I'm finding it hard. It feels a little bit like Groundhog's Day. And so I think more than ever, it's about mixing it up, doing things differently. Um, I, I can't do another sort of social Zoom um, because mm-hmm. I don't want to sit in front of the screen any more than I have to. But I am trying to find new ways to invigorate myself and my team. So um, there's there's a couple of things. One is we've been doing book clubs. So this culture map, um, both of my teams um, we're, we're reading as a group. So we're doing it sort of chapter by chapter, week by week, and somebody leads the chapter. And we spend 15 minutes where we just talk about the book and have some interesting debate and have some good laughs and 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 we sort we certainly do our updates of you know key challenges and anything that you know we need to help getting unstuck throughout the business. Um, but then we've been talking about these different books, um, and not everybody's a reader. So you know I've got some people on my teams that are doing um, audiobooks. I've got some people who are just saying, you know what, I'd rather just re- watch some short videos and share what I'm learning on the topic. Mm. All of that's great. I would say one other thing that that I've actually done since the beginning of the first lockdown, so since March, I start the week on Monday mornings where I do a 15-minute catch-up with my my whole team. I ask a single question, and it's not business-related. It is usually something that sparks some really interesting conversation. Everybody has to answer really quick, rapid fire. And uh, it's questions like, if you were on a deserted island and you could invite five people for one dinner, who would it be and what would you eat? If you were to have the ability to spend the rest of your life on a boat or in a camper van, what would it be? Um, And so it's just one of those funny things where you start the week off, everybody's got a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. The, the answers that people come up with are pretty amazing. Uh, we've learned a lot about each other. I, I asked my team about, I don't know, six months ago, hey, do you guys want to stop this? And they said, no, let's keep doing it. Um, and so what I actually did for Christmas is I, I printed each one of these questions on a little uh, card and ended up with a pretty significant deck of cards and sent those cards to everyone and told them to share it with their family or friends over wine or dinner. And so it's been sort of fun table topics as well, but really just trying to find new ways to shake it up. Um, the last thing I would share is we do, you know, in, in one-to-ones or in some of the meetings where we don't have to be in front of the screen, I ask my team to go outside and take a walk and take a photo of wherever you are and whatever your view is at that moment and share it with the group. And that's been kind of fun too, because oftentimes we'll be on calls with people from, you know, California to Amsterdam to the UK. And uh, so it's, it's fun, except when California is bright and shiny and I'm under an umbrella <laughs> of a torrential downpour. That's so connecting. I love that, that way of just sort of, you know, starting the week off with some inspiration. And, and I know you also do your cards on LinkedIn with the kind of almost like a thought for the day yes. that you're sort of putting around the house. And um, I'm a big fan of those. Thank you. It's been fun. They were a bit of a, a labor of love that started last 
last year. Um, it actually started with some, I, I, my new year's resolution was to spread kindness and encouragement to, to women. And so what I decided to do was that I was going to put little inspirational sayings on a card and stick it in the women's loo in our office. And, um, and what was really fun about that is that nobody knew who it was. And so I'd be sort of washing my hands at the sink and someone would go, my God, did you see the card in there? Do you know who's doing it? And I was like, no, but they must be really, really cool. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I did that for three months and, uh, and it was so awesome to just hear people talk about it. And then we all got sent home. And so there was no more women's loo. And then I decided, you know what, I'll just start putting them on LinkedIn and not have it just be focused on female empowerment, but, but just be about spreading kindness and the fact that, you know, all of, we were all in the exact same boat around the world. You know, we, we all needed a bit of inspiration. And so, so I did it for the entire course of 2020 and, uh, and I thought, Oh good, 2020 is over. I can stop. But, but actually I got so many notes and calls and texts that was like, you can't stop now. Um, and so now it went from cards against insanity to now it's compliment cards. So 2021 is about um, how to give compliments, good, bad, or ugly. So it's, it's fun. It is a labor of love, but it, but it's, it's, it's fun at the same time. I'm going to move on to the part of the podcast now where we're going to get a little bit more personal. Sure. So we'll start with what's your guilty pleasure? Okay. So there's probably a tie. One is I have no shame in a love for smut TV. 90 Day Fiance, if you haven't watched it, you totally should. It is completely <laughs> going to rot your brain, but worth it. And then the second is uh, something that I will admit to, even though admitting this to Tamara is a complete nightmare because she actually has an amazing voice and I do not, but I will bring the house down in a karaoke bar bring the house down at least in my own mind i'm bringing the house down but uh i mean mr brightside i I will literally crush on a microphone preferably not sharing the stage with anybody else um (laughs) and i think they sound absolutely amazing but i'm sure i did not i have heard it i completely agree you absolutely bring the house down <laughs> and and thank you for admitting that you just want to be there on your own yeah i mean i don't need to share the stage with anyone she did. <laughs> <Get out. laughs> so you might have just answered this next question but what's your idea of a perfect weekend <laughs> do you know what my idea of a perfect weekend i mean one of the millions of reasons why I love living in London is how easy it is to to hit a random city in Europe inside of an hour. I love a weekend away into a new city that I've never been to, preferably one with amazing food without my children, without some great friends or with some great friends to (laughs) to share it with. But I love adventure. I love traveling um, and I'm dying to get back to it. This may have changed in lockdown now, but what app could you not live without? Oh, God. See, it's. I would say that lockdown has made the app that I can't live without being Amazon, which is really, really annoying. But I've got a terrible Amazon addiction. <laughs> and my my husband, I mean, it's like he is completely torturing me about it. But I guess it's now the app that I can't live without, which is so annoying. It used to be embarrassingly city mapper because even though I've lived here for eight years, I cannot find my way out of a paper bag. So that was the one I truly couldn't live without, but now I never leave my house. So I wouldn't know what the city is like. (laughs) You're talking to someone who I get lost coming out of shops. So I need a map with me at all times. (laughs) I still can't find my way around my local environment at all. And when my out of towners (laughs) come and, and visit, they're always like, I'm like, God, they're totally going to regret having to follow me around the city. And worst of all is when I'm walking down the street and someone asks me for directions and then they hear the American accent and, you know, they're like, oh, I picked the wrong person entirely. (laughs) I think I've got one of those faces where people think that I know what I'm doing. And so they ask me directions. It's a big, big mistake. (laughs) So, Julie, if you could invent something, what would it be? If I could invent something... I would say pre-lockdown, if I could invent something that would just slow time down, 
a little bit, that would be great. I sort of, every birthday that hits, I'm like, oh my God, who is this lady? <laughs> How did I become some middle-aged lady? This is so bizarre. Um, somebody calls me ma'am and I'm like kind of looking over my shoulder, like who are they talking to? <laughs> but I would say more more crazy than that is I, I look at my kids and I just think, oh my gosh, how did, how did this happen? I've got almost... 13 year old and a 16 year old. And it was literally in the blink of an eye. Um, so I would love to slow time, but I would like to fast forward through this lockdown and then slow time. But, but actually I will say, and, and this is such a corny thing, but I will say that because time's moving so quickly, this lockdown has been a, a bit of a gift as well, where I've sort of spent more time with my teenagers than I think they would have liked, but than I think we would have ever spent with them, you know, ha had we not had this mm -hmm. opportunity. So we're trying to look at some silver linings. Again, I'm sure they wouldn't say this, but, um, but nobody gets to spend this much time and actually enjoy it with a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. I think in the first lockdown in particular, there was very much that sense of it did feel like time had slowed down. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And if you did manage to slow time down and it gave you an extra hour every day, yeah. what would you do with it? I would go outside. This is an absolutely amazing city. Uh, I think no matter where you live, all you have to do is walk around and look up. I am obsessed with walking everywhere in this, in this city and I would spend more time outside. You know, I think w one of the things that's, that's hardest over the winter here, certainly, is that it was easy to do, you know, walking calls and and at least spend some time. We had this gift of the most beautiful spring in the history of the UK, um, and and we were all we all happened to be in lockdown. Um, but I think that just spending more time outside, getting some fresh air, and in, enjoying being able to be active and and just. Uh, appreciate whatever the weather is, um, but, but I would get out more. How do you think your friends would describe you? Oh, let's see. I, you know, I would say, I hope, I hope my friends would say that I am supportive and loving and I am really committed to remembering to remember my, I have a mentor who I've had for many, many years. And, and he said to me years ago, the most important thing is to remember, to remember. And I was sort of like, what's he even talking about? And over the years, I've really learned that it's important to remember, remember what's going on in people's lives that you love. Um, remember to tell people how you feel, remember to not forget when somebody's going through a bad time or when somebody's got an exciting interview or starting a new job or whatever it is. Um, it takes two seconds to drop a text or a handwritten note. And I'm really, really committed to that. So I hope that my friends would say that I am committed to them. I, you know, one of the things that I have sort of this criteria that I live my life by. I've got personal criteria and professional criteria. And um, number one on my personal criteria is to be the very best mother and wife and sister and daughter and friend and boss and colleague that I can be, but know that I'm not always going to get it right and be okay with that. The being okay with that part isn't, isn't the easy part, but mm. I'm, I'm doing the very, very best I can. And would they describe you as an introvert or an extrovert? Yeah. I think I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, funniest question. Uh, extrovert, for sure. I, I mean, extrovert, always been an extrovert. Um, but as an extrovert, there's things that um, I'm still really intimidated by going into sort of a, a random business event or a networking event. I, I always sort of dread that. And once I'm there, I usually sort of walk out going, oh, I'm so glad I did that. It was amazing. Um, but, but I do always kind of dread it, which makes me go, am I an extrovert? But I am. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Well, the first time that you and I met, Tamara, we had to stand up in front of a group of people and say what our superpower is. And so I would say I have two of them. One superpower is that I can sleep anytime, anywhere. I can sleep on a rock 
outside in the middle of traffic. I can sleep on an airplane no matter how long or short. I could sleep in a taxi. I could sleep anywhere. Um, so that's definitely a superpower. And the other is that I'm definitely a super wine drinking lady. I'm really good at that too. <laughs> I'm good at one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, we're coming to the end. Is there anything that you wish we had asked you or any other closing thoughts? Well, you guys asked me when I was a little girl what I wanted to be when I grew up, but you haven't asked me as a middle-aged lady that goes by ma'am what I want to be when I grow up. So I'm going to ask myself that question and I'm going to answer it for you too. I have very big aspirations for when I grow up. I want to be a lady of leisure, which I think I would be absolutely amazing at that. I want to live by the beach. I want to drink Chardonnay for breakfast. I want to have a gorgeous, incredibly young, very tan tennis coach to teach me how to be an amazing tennis superstar. I want to be a lady that lunches with my older lady girlfriends. And I want to do all of that while sitting on the beach in some tropical paradise. Um, so that is my retirement plan. It is my, when I grow up, I want to be plan. And uh, now I just need to work on my tennis skills, I bet. <laughs> that all sounds a lot better than just carrying a briefcase. I, quite I know, yeah. <laughs> I know, so much better. You've been listening to Genuine Humans, brought to you by The Social Element. If you loved what you heard, remember to subscribe or you can find out more at www.thesocialelement.agency.